Okay, uh, well, welcome to the last talk of the uh, last talk of the afternoon. Let's make a quick announcement. So, at 5 30 reception, uh, from 5 30 to 7, there's a reception out there. But first, let's we'll enjoy uh, the talk of Francois Gulls. We'll talk about quantum and what's the time of the world. Thank you very much for the introduction and uh, thank you for inviting me uh, here in uh, Leipzig. I'm very happy to celebrate uh, the 50th birthday of Alexis. We've known each other for quite a long time, I think. I think, um, yeah, we met uh, first uh, in the late 90s. I think you were still a PhD student or you're beginning your PhD with Jan. And, but more about that later, right? I mean, so, so yeah. Uh, let me go immediately uh, um, with the uh, with the mathematics. Let me start immediately with the mathematics here. So I want to report on a joint uh, work with my friend Thierry Paul, now in Rome, but at the time, uh, the time uh, it was working uh, in the same lab as I at Ecole Polytechnique. And um, so, yes, quantum Wasserstein and observability. So it sounds pretty scary. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, let me say a few words about quantum dynamics. It has nothing to do with the subject matter of this conference. I'm very sorry, but uh, are you all right with this? Oh, great, great, great. I mean, the birthday boy has to be happy, yes. So, um, all right, very good. So quantum dynamics uh, for most mathematicians start with the Schrodinger equation. Um, so here we have the Schrodinger equation here. So we see on the right-hand side the quantum Hamiltonian. The mass of the particle has been taken equal to 1. That's where you have an h bar squared divided by 2 Laplacian plus v. v is the external potential uh, prescribed, say. And psi mm -hmm. is a function of t and x, complex valued, and its L2 norm is equal to 1. That's what you mean usually when you say that you have a wave function. So that's the mod squared of psi is a density, the probability density <coughs> in the space of the position, right, uh, of the particle. So this is a IH bar delta T of psi equals to the quantum Hamiltonian applied to psi. The quantum Hamiltonian here, instead of being a function, as in classical mechanics, turns out to be an operator, an unbounded operator here. Now, um, <coughs> turns out that, um, so this, this uh, formulation in terms of wave function uh, is for pure states, and uh, if you uh, prefer mixed states, um, then uh, you might want to write instead of the Schrodinger equation what goes by the name of the von Neumann equation, uh, which is written here. So it's an equation where the unknown is an operator. So it's the time-dependent operator, R of t. And here this unknown is going to be a self-adjoint operator, non-negative, on your Hilbert space L2 of Rd, and uh, not only that, but it's going to be trace class with trace equal to one. Obviously, the trace equal to one is uh, a, a constraint of the same type as here. And you can think of this R of T as being sort of a non-commutative or quantum analog of uh, probability density or probability measure. Uh, but um, yes, I mean, there's no probability space here, right? I mean, it's analogous, but that's what I can say. Now, uh, a few words about the, uh, the, the potential here. Yeah, the von Neumann equation is just the IH bar del T of R. T equals the commutator of this Hamiltonian with R of T, right? So it's a differential equation, not a PDE, you might say. I mean, although if you write the uh, integral kernel for R of T, then it becomes a PDE, obviously. <laughs> Anyway, so here, um, a few words about the potential here. So the potential V is going to be a real valued function such that uh, my curly H, uh, the quantum Hamiltonian, has a self-adjoint extension to L2 of Rd. And uh, therefore, if I look at uh, the exponential of minus it is curly H over H bar, there's going to be a unitary group on uh, Gothic H. Gothic H is going to be L2, right, of Rd. Uh, by Stone's theorem, and you solve uh, for the Schrodinger equation, you find psi at time t by this formula, you apply the uh, u of t, quantum dynamics, to psi at time t equal to zero. And of course, for r of t, it's the same, except instead you conjugate the initial data here, r of zero is, being, is going to be conjugated by u of t, right? So it's u of t, r of zero, u of t star. Very good. So. Um, Okay, so that's uh, 
that explain the words that explains the word uh, quantum. Okay, now uh, a few words about observing solutions of a PDL. Let me start with a very simple example. So uh, it's an example of which everyone knows. So suppose you take a domain in the complex plane, domain being a connected open set, and take um, an open subset of your domain, right, non-empty, and suppose that you look, so I, I want to phrase this in terms of PDEs, because this is a PDE uh, thing. So instead of saying that I'm looking at a holomorphic function, I'm going to look at the distribution, which is in the null space of the cauchy riemann operator. This is the same thing, of course. So we have d bar f equals zero, so you have a PDE. And you know by analytic continuation that if you uh, assume that f restricted to you non-empty open set omega is equal to zero, then f is going to be equal to zero on the connected uh, u. Uh, it's going to be equal to zero everywhere. Okay, so that's observability in the sense that <coughs> you have this uh, PDE and you have a partial observation of f on some subdomain for your PDE. And from this, you infer uh, f everywhere on u, okay? Good. So now then there's a, there's a question which is a little more interesting, actually, is whether uh, there exists a constant that would depend on omega and capital U, a positive constant, such that, uh, for instance, if uh, your uh, PDE is satisfied on the big domain, then, the, for instance, in the uniform norm, <coughs> uh, F is controlled by the quantity that you observe, right? So the restriction of f on the domain, on the subdomain where you observe it, right? And uh, you can think about uh, whether this inequality is always satisfied, whether it is uh, always such a constant. Uh, that's, uh, I think, also an interesting exercise. I mean, sometimes, yeah, sometimes no. Okay, good. All right. So now I'm um, returning to uh, quantum dynamics. And I want to think about observation inequality uh, in quantum dynamics. So now, of course, we have time and space, right? And I'm going to say that a class uh, curly K, a quantum state at t equals zero, is going to be observable in some omega, or some open set in Rd uh, for some time capital T, positive time capital T, if and only if, well, there exists some positive constants, some observation constants, C obs, right, positive, such that, well, if I look at the L2 norm of my wave function in the interval 0t cross omega, this controls the L2 norm of your uh, wave function, for instance, initially, everywhere. So if you control it initially everywhere, you control it at any time, any subsequent time everywhere, because you have a unitary group. So, uh, so you, I mean, observing for any time between zero and capital T uh, reduces to uh, this inequality here. And of course, because it's a weight function here, this is equal to one. And uh, of course, I want this to be, uh, I want this inequality to hold for all psi in this class kappa, of course, okay? Good. Uh, you can formulate the same problem uh, for the in the case of von Neumann equation. So here you have to replace the L2 norm by a trace, okay? And you have to re replace the restriction to omega by, uh, say, you, you're multiplying R of t by the indicator of omega. This is really the same thing. So you, you take R of t, this is a uh, trace class operator. You multiply these by an indicator of omega. It's a multiplication operator that's bounded. So the result is trace class. You take the trace, you integrate between zero and t, and you ask the same question as before. Okay, and here again, you want to restrict. You you, you want that your that your uh, state belongs to the, this class uh, curly k. Good. Um, so now, uh, why are people why have people been interested in this, this business? Well, that, this is in the community of control uh, controllability for PDEs. There's something that goes by the name of the Hilbert uniqueness method, which I believe was due to uh, Jacques Rillions. Although uh, Jacques Rillions, um, <coughs> if I remember, formulated this uh, condition or this method in the case of the wave equation. And uh, I think there uh, existed earlier versions for uh, abstract ODEs, if I remember. Anyway, so let me uh, explain 
uh, how it works in the case of the Schrodinger equation, for those of you who are not conversant with the uh, this control business, right? Uh, so, uh, okay, so here we have a self-adjoint Hamiltonian, which I recall, it's one half of Laplacian plus V. The, um, uh, the Planck constant has disappeared because it's not needed uh, here, right? Um, so it's a self-adjoint uh, Hamiltonian, quantum Hamiltonian, and you are going to look at two different problems. The first one is a control problem, which is written here. So I delta of phi equals H phi plus the indicator uh, of zero T cross little omega of F, and... <coughs> Uh, phi at t equals capital T equals zero. How should you understand this problem here? So the problem here is that you start from some initial data, which is not specified here, and you would like to find the control, so the way by which you act on the system, uh, but you are allowed to act on the system only for x in the subdomain little omega, and you are only allowed to act between time zero and time capital T. And you want that by this action, you send any initial data to zero at time capital T. So if you can reach zero, you can reach anything else, essentially. Okay? All right, so that's the control problem. Uh, the, um, there's another problem, which is the observation problem, the observability problem, which is that you look at the same uh, Schrodinger equation as before, I delta T psi equals H psi. But here, describe the initial data, psi t equals zero. And the observation consists of uh, looking at the restriction of psi to zero t cross little omega. Okay, so you have in this way two operators. The first one, let me call it the control operator. So the first one is an operator from L2 to zero t cross omega in which your control F belongs. And this operator will return the initial data. So uh, for simplicity, it's better to multiply this initial data by minus i for a reason that will become obvious in a few minutes, right? And this guy is going to be in L2 of Rd and the observation operator. So you prescribe the initial data psi in and you look at the solution. So psi initial is in L2 of Rd and you look at the solution in L2 of 0D cross omega after restriction to little omega, okay? Good, so these are the two operators of interest here. And the thing is that you have this um, little computation which is um, essentially integrating by parts. So you pick your favorite psi initial in L2 of omega, you pick your favorite control in 0T cross little omega, Oh, why is that uh, capital omega? Let me see, uh, let me return backwards. There is no capital omega here. Sorry, capital omega should be Rd, right? There's no, there's a, yeah, so it's L2 of Rd, okay? And you, uh, you pick your favorite control, and then you look at the observation, at the observed solution psi of t, which you integrate against the control localized in little <laughs> omega, okay? So then uh, you do the, uh, so th this is the right-hand side of your Schrodinger equation. You use the fact that H is self-adjoint, you integrate by pass, and at the end of the day, you find that this is equal to the integral of sine bar times the control operator acting on F, okay? So uh, what this computation tells you is that um, the observation operator is the adjoint of the control operator, and therefore, uh, if you look at the null space of the observation operator orthogonal, this is going to be the closure of the range of the control operator. So you have this duality here, right? which I mean, simple uh, uh, functional analysis. However, you know, we, we, if you have observability, you have a little more information in the sense you yet that you have this constant here. Uh, here or there, whatever you prefer. And because of this constant, this constant will tell you that some operator is going to be a closed operator, will have closed range, right? Particular, uh, if you look at the composition of C with O, right? This is control following observation. Then this is an operator which has closed range. And with this, uh, you easily see that the fact that this uh, constant is positive implies that in fact, it's not the closure of the range of C, which is the orthogonal of the observation operator, the null space of the, uh, of the observation operator. It's the range of the control operator itself. 
which is equal to, to this. So in other words, what this means is that you are able to control not only a dense subset of initial data, but the whole set of it, all initial data uh, here, right? So, you know, if you're interested in controlling uh, a PDE, then the observation problem is of interest uh, because of that um, uh, duality uh, observation, okay? Duality remark, so to speak, okay? Mm -hmm. Good, so um, now, if we return to this, uh, if we return to the problem, uh, which I'm going to show you again here, well, it's known that whether you, you look at this equation here or that equation, this is the, if you want, this is the equivalent of Newton's second law in quantum mechanics. And uh, you know there is a scaling or a limit, a physical limit, uh, according to which if, uh, if you want, if h bar, let me put it in this way, if h bar tends to zero, which I shouldn't say really because h bar is a constant. So in other words, if the typical action of the particle that you're considering is large compared to h bar, to the Planck constant, then <coughs> uh, the, um, the evolution, the dynamics corresponding to the Schrodinger equation, which will look very much like classical mechanics. In other words, this will converge in some sense, whatever that means to uh, or the solution to the Schrodinger equation will converge in some sense to the solution of uh, Newton's second law uh, of motion, F equals ma. Good. So um, now, um, uh, so the problem of controlling the, the wave equation, so I mentioned earlier that this uh, HUM was written first for the, for the wave equation. So the problem of controlling uh, the... Um, wave equation, observing or controlling the wave equation, we've seen that these two things are essentially uh, adjoined to each other, uh, was studied by uh, several people, uh, including the gentlemen whose names are mentioned here, Claude Bardot, Gilles Lebeau, and Jeff Rauch. And in the early 90s, uh, shortly before we met, yes, they came up with the following geometric condition. So it's not exactly the thing that they wrote because they wanted to control the wave equation from the boundary, which is a much more complicated business than what I'm going to do here. And it's the wave equation, it's not the Schrodinger equation. Okay, but essentially it's going to be the same uh, IT. So you look at the classical Hamiltonian, right, which here is going to be one half of psi squared plus V of X, right, as a function of X and psi. And you look, uh, so, so this uh, Hamiltonian generates um, the system of uh, Hamilton's ODEs, x dot equals uh, del H by del Xi, which here is equal to Xi. Okay, it's a kinematic equation. If you want, this is the definition of velocity. And here you have Newton's second log Xi dot equals minus del H uh, by del X, which here is minus del V of X. And you start from uh, some position and momentum at t equals zero. And now the geometric condition uh, proposed by Bardos, Lobo, and Rauch is written here. So it's a geometric condition which is going to um, um, consider the case of a triple k, omega, and capital T, where k is a compact in phase space, so in the space of position and momenta, right? So it's a compact in R2D. Omega is an open set in the space of position, so it's an open set in RD, and capital T is positive. And so the geometric condition is that you want that for each x and xi in capital K, there exists some time in zero, cap in zero capital T, such that the position uh, starting from x and xi, little x and xi in K, right, and uh, uh, for some time between zero and capital T, the position is going to fall in omega, okay? So if this condition is satisfied, then uh, Bardos, Lebeau, and Raj um, uh, claimed that uh, the system would be uh, controllable or observable, right? Okay, so um, <clears throat> let me illustrate this geometric condition, which may look uh, a bit strange uh, uh, to begin with, uh, but I'm going to illustrate it in space dimension one, right? And in the case where v equal to zero. So here the the evolution is just a classical free flow. So x psi goes into x plus t psi and psi. So now I'm going to look at the uh, closed phase space rectangle K, which is here represented at uh, t equals zero, right? 
and uh, I'm going to move it by this map. And so uh, say at time t equals one half, I get this. At time equal one, I get this. The more I advance, the more tilted this thing is going to be, right? And uh, you see that the first interval here, capital omega, satisfies the geometric condition with capital T equals one. And uh, this is uh, not as uh, little omega, because if you see uh, little omega, you see that phase space points on the bottom sides of K, right? They don't, they stay out of the strip, which is built on omega. Um, therefore, for all time between zero and one. So in other words, if you want to observe, uh, if you want to observe your solution by sitting here, you have to wait for a longer time because uh, for, these, uh, for these guys to arrive, for these phase space points here to enter omega, right? Mm -hmm. So essentially that's what it is, except that you want this in a higher dimensional space, okay? And in a higher dimension, I don't know how to draw pictures, right? So that's why I'm not doing it, okay? All right, so now um, <clears throat> I'm going to change gear for a moment, uh, and um, uh, I'm going to introduce a tool which I'm going to be using to answer the problem of observ observability uh, for quantum dynamics, which has to do with uh, the second part of the title, which was uh, optimal transport or quantum optimal, I don't know what is it, quantum Wasserstein, whatever it was in the, in the title, okay? So uh, the idea is that you, in, in, um, <clears throat> to measure the distance between um, uh, probability densities, um, boiled probability densities on some Euclidean space, or here it's going to be uh, phase space probability densities or phase space probability measures, right? Uh, the um, uh, Wasserstein distance is an object of great interest uh, because uh, really this is something that if you look at uh, mm -hmm. um, measures which are Dirac measures, turns out to be exactly equal to the uh, uh, usual uh, Euclidean distance between the support and the points at which your, these Dirac measures are supported. Right? So it's, it's interesting here, if you think that these objects, right, these quantum objects that you propagate, are going to concentrate on phase space trajectories. So the Wasserstein turns out to be an interesting object to, to, to deal with, okay? You agree with me? Yes, okay, sure, yes. You always agree with me, it's very nice, uh, fine. Okay, very good. So now uh, the, um, the Wasserstein distance is usually defined by means of uh, couplings or transport plans so here is how it works. So here I'm going to take F to be a probability density on R2D, right? Uh, and I want to couple that with a density <laughs> operator. So a density operator is going to be a um, self-adjoint operator on H, okay? Non-negative and whose trace is equal to one. Therefore, it's a trace class operator, okay? Good. So what is a coupling of these two objects? Well, very simple. This is going to be an operator valued function of the phase space point X and Xi. So to each phase space point X and Xi, you associate a self-adjoint operator Q of X and Xi, Q equals Q star. It's a bounded operator. Uh, Q is non-negative almost everywhere. And you want that if you average out the quantum coordinates, that is, if you take the trace of that operator, you find f of x and psi, the first marginal condition, whereas if you average out the classical variable, so if you integrate q of x and psi in x and psi, then you should find this equal to r. Now, if you're really picky about measure theory, you might say, wait a minute, here I'm taking an integral uh, of uh, bounded operators, bounded operators are not separable, but here observe that, in fact, um, for almost every x and psi, these guys are going to be trace class, okay? So trace class operators, this is a separable uh, uh, Banach space, so no worries about uh, measurability issues uh, here, right? So, uh, okay, very good. So the set of couplings of F and R is denoted by curly C of F and R, and it's always non-empty because you can take the uh, stupid coupling, which is just that uh, to each point x and psi, you associate F of x and psi times R, uh, which, if you want, it's the tensor product, right? It's the equivalent of tensor product for probability measures. Okay. All right. So this is so much for the couplings. Uh, then, um, then you have to specify the cost of transporting from uh, classical phase space point 
to some quantum point, whatever point quantum point may, means. As, I mean, there's no such thing as a quantum point here. But yeah, I mean, uh, we're going to, to copy formulas and see what happens, right? So the quantum to transfer, the quantum to transfer, the classical to quantum transfer cost is going to be a different operator, which is going to be parameterized with a classical phase space variable. So you can think of it as a differential operator in y and in the variable y, okay? And uh, so it's a C lambda h bar, parameterized by x and psi. What it is really, it's a harmonic oscillator in, in y, okay? Which has been uh, translated in phase space by x and psi, right? So here you see you have the distance from the classical point to the quantum point. Here the classical momentum to the quantum momentum, okay? It's a shifted harmonic oscillator. And by Heisenberg uncertainty and equality, you know, it's bounded below by lambda dh bar. Okay. Good. Now, with this, you have enough to define a kind of metric. Uh, so I'm going to pick uh, a density operator, uh, which is finite, which has finite energy with respect to the, um, uh, to the, to, to the harmonic oscillator, right? And I'm going to pick a classical uh, probability density and phase space, uh, which has uh, five second order moments uh, phase space, right, in space and momentum. And I define the, I copy the same formula as for Wasserstein distance. I define Gothic d lambda of f to r squared. So to do this, I have to, uh, I'm going to take C h bar lambda, multiply it by Q of x and psi. Now, because these are operators, I want something to be, uh, uh, I, I want the, what is here to be a, a positive quantity, a positive operator. I multiply before and after C so that this operator here is going to be self-adjoint, okay? Now I take the trace. Well, this operator may not be trace class, but you don't care. It's like when you integrate uh, a measurable positive function, maybe it's equal to infinity, maybe the integral is equal to plus infinity, that's it, right? And uh, here I integrate again. So it could happen that this is equal to plus infinity, fine. But anyway, here I'm taking the infimum, right? I'm taking the infimum. <laughs> and in any case, this is always going to be larger than or equal to lambda dh bar because of this operator inequality here, okay? Good. So that's the... That's the metric between quotes, right? Because really, um, I'm really uh, comparing uh, pears and apples here, right? I mean, because I have a quantum density and, uh, and the classical density, so not the same things at all, right? Good. All right, so the nice thing about this quantity is that it's very nicely propagated by the, uh, by the quantum dynamics. Uh, beautifully propagated, essentially everything uh, happens as if the um, quantum dynamics was a long trajectory. So I'm going to show you that in a minute, right? Uh, so this is something that we observed with uh, Thierry Paul, uh, I mean, already before we wrote this uh, thing about observability. So I'm going to assume V to be a C11, so um, uh, class C1 function uh, with Lipschitz continuous gradients. And uh, well, certainly with that, the curly H operator, one half uh, H bar uh, squared Laplacian plus V, uh, certainly that is a self-joint extension to Gothic H. And uh, so I define U of T to be the associated, uh, associated um, um, uh, dynamics, associated dynamics, right, e to the minus I T curly H over H bar. And phi, a T X and Xi, uh, is going to be the flow of the classical Hamiltonian uh, well, capital H of x and psi, which is uh, one half of psi squared plus v of x, right? So you want to compare these two dynamics. As I said, these two dynamics are very different objects. So this is an this is a a, a um, unitary operator in Gothic H, and this is a transformation on the on phase space, uh, canonical transform on phase space, if you want. But still, uh, I mean, these objects have nothing to do with one another. Priori. However, here's what you do: you take your uh, you take your initial um, probability density in phase space, which you compose with the classical dynamics. You take your initial density operator uh, uh, R in. You conjugate it by the quantum dynamics, and you want to compare these two objects with their initial values. In other words, 
Gothic D lambda of F initial R initial. And the result is that uh, this uh, is, I mean, the ratio of these two quantities grows exponentially fast. And the uh, exponential that appears here is going to be uh, with, uh, with some constant L, which is going to be one half of lambda plus Lipschitz constant of grad V over lambda. Okay, good. So um, now, um, why is this natural? And what does this have to do with classical mechanics? Let's uh, work out the following little exercise. Okay, suppose that instead of comparing a classical dynamics with a quantum dynamics, suppose that you take two uh, trajectories of two phase space points moving with the same dynamics, so the same potential, and you look at how the trajectories of uh, these two phase space points are going to diverge as uh, time evolves uh, because of, uh, I mean, due to the difference of their initial beta. Right, so uh, here I'm I'm looking at the difference. So the, the two tra trajectories are going to be x t psi t and y t eta t. Right. So the first one I'm looking at the uh, kinematic equation. So this definition of velocity. So x dot t minus y dot t is equal to psi t minus eta t. And uh, then the Newton second law. I take the difference again. So uh, psi dot t minus eta dot t is equal to minus del v at x of t minus LV at Y of T, right? So that's the equation. And now you want to compute the evolution of the phase space distance with this weight lambda squared, right? So you look at del D by DT of lambda square, uh, the norm of XT minus YT to the square plus the Euclidean norm of XIT minus eta T to the square. Well, I mean, you compute, this is not very hard. Multiply this by uh, you take the inner product with of this with uh, psi t uh, my, uh, with uh, sorry x t minus y t, the inner product of that was psi t minus eta t. Multiply the first one by lambda square, right, and uh, you get this obviously. Now here I'm going to use Cauchy-Schwarz. Uh, so I instead of these uh, stupid uh, inner products, I have the product of uh, Euclidean norms like this. And now here, um, uh, okay, so here I'm going to insert, uh, I'm going to use here the fact that del V has a Lipschitz uh, constant, uh, which is known, right? And so you see what I'm doing here. I pull out the Lipschitz constant in front, uh, multiply it by, by lambda, right? And then I use uh, whatever you call it, the peter Paul inequality, uh, whatever it is. And at the end of the day, you get lambda plus the Lipschitz constant of del V over lambda times this thing here. And by Grunewald, uh, you get, uh, well, I mean, you get an exponential growth, which is exactly the same as the one that you find in the theorem here. Now, uh, as I said, uh, the uh, quantum dynamics is not supposed to occur on trajectories. But nevertheless, this computation here is compelling. You're, I hope you believe me. Or maybe we'll return to that. Maybe I'll show you the proof if I have time, uh, if time permits. Uh, uh, but uh, I think this computation is enough to convince you that uh, the same inequality has a good chance to work in the, in the quantum, for the quantum uh, metric as well. Okay? All right, so I'm going to uh, I'm going to skip the proof of propagation theorem uh, for the moment in the interest of time and move on with the um, <coughs> observability uh, problem. Okay, so we take this uh, propagation theorem for granted and see where we shall return to that later if if, if needed. Mm -hmm. All right, so now let me return to this observability problem, and uh, so we have this geometric condition. Uh, which tells you, so maybe I'll show it to you again. Maybe it's, uh, maybe it's a uh, good idea to look at it again. So the um, thing is that, all right, so you, you have some compact sets in phase space, some open domain in the space position, some capital time, some capital T, which is a time, right? And what you're doing, you start from any point in your compact set. And uh, what you want is that the uh, the position of your classical point, the position of your classical trajectory, is going to enter omega for some time between zero and capital T. Okay, if you have this, then you can observe the solution from omega. I mean, you can observe solutions which are going to be concentrated in some sense in phase space inside K, of course. Right? That will come, come to that later. Okay. 
All right, so uh, what am I doing here? All right, so now with this, um, with this uh, geometric condition, then actually you can uh, sort of strengthen it um, into obtaining some observability <coughs> constant or something that's going to play the role of an observability constant. But this observability constant is going to be a purely geometric. Okay, and here's how it works. So you start from your triple, where k is the, set, the compact set of initial uh, phase space points. Omega is your observation domain. Uh, T is the observation time, right? And the geometry condition tells you that if you look at the infimum of the indicator of omega evaluated at x of t little x cap little psi dt, so this is the trajectory uh, of the Hamiltonian, the classical trajectory uh, time t starting from x and psi, right? So here, uh, essentially, you test whether it belongs to omega or not. You integrate between zero and capital T, and you minimize over the uh, compact uh, set K, right? And um, then uh, this gives you a constant, C of K, omega, and capital T. Or I, I mean, this is a geometric object, right? Uh, how many times this trajectory is going to pass in omega. And what I'm saying is that this, uh, with the information that we have so far, this uh, constant is this uh, capital C, if you, if you want geometric observability, observability constant, is going to be positive. And the argument is a little logical argument because omega is open, then, then this, is, this indicator is lower semi-continuous. And we know that for each x and psi in uh, k, not rd in k, then you can find some time uh, and some, uh, some interval of time because omega is open such that uh, this is going to be equal to 1 uh, for time uh, t next or near t x psi. Of course, here everybody depends on x and psi. Right? So then this integral here is bounded mm -hmm. below by 2 eta of x and psi, which is positive. But now the thing is that if you look at this uh, function here as a function of little x and little psi, again, it's slow to make continuous in k, which is compact, by fatu, right? And therefore, you have a, a minimum on k, and therefore, it's positive, right? That's how you get it. It's positive without even assuming anything more than this geometric condition. Okay. So that's elementary topological observation, if you want. Now, with this, you can, uh, you can, uh, you can, you, you can use this to have an observability constant uh, for quantum dynamics. So here's how it, here is how it works. So V is going to be uh, your C11 potential. Uh, K, omega, and T. And so this is the compact uh, domain, the compact set of initial data, uh, classical initial data. Omega is your observation domain. T is your observation time, satisfying the balance of Borosh geometric condition. What I'm saying is that for all uh, initial uh, density operator with finite energy, if you want, with having second order moments, and uh, all positive delta. If you denote by omega delta the thickening of omega of by a distance delta, right? Then you have the, the you have the following inequality, which is observation inequality here. So if you look at the quantity, I mean the uh, the, the right hand side of the observation inequality, which is that you evolve your uh, initial condition, quantum initial condition, you evolve it during time t, you localize it into your slightly larger domain omega. Uh, you take the trace, you integrate between zero and capital T, and that you would like to know that it's bounded below by a constant uniformly over, uh, you know, all um, initial data, um, uh, which are somehow concentrated approximately in phase space in, in K. And the, the, the thing is that uh, this quantity here is going to be bounded below by the geometric constant, which has been which is a consequence. Uh, the, the fact that this positive is a consequence of the balanced Le Borosh, uh, geometric condition. And there is a semi-classical correction, which is uh, a little bit awful here, but turns out to be actually given by uh, some explicit formula, right? So the, it's explicit, not very nice, but it's explicit nevertheless. I mean, the, the, so in other words, here um, you have this, which is bounded below by something which is geometric and therefore which you hope you can... I mean, compute by geometric means. That's nothing to do with, uh, there's no PDE stuff here, just uh, 
looking at trajectories, crossing open sets, it's purely geometric, it's a purely geometric problem. And you have this, uh, you have this object here, which is, well, I mean, a nice function, like in high school, right? And you have this, which is not really like in high school. So I need to, to tell you a few, I mean, this is the quantum to classical uh, Wasserstein stuff. Uh, yeah, I mean, now in high school, the level has gone down a bit. So, yeah. So I'm going to explain, I'm going to give you two examples where this is, uh, this is going to, to be known, right? Uh, with this semi-classical correction, it's going to be known. Okay, so the first example, which is somehow the best, the most beloved uh, uh, example is the case of Toplitz initial data. So Toplitz initial data is uh, a big name uh, for the following object. So you take, uh, you know, in quantum mechanics, you have something that goes by the name of Schrodinger, uh, Schrodinger coherent states, right? So if you want, it's the, yeah, I mean, it's the thing with, which is the equivalent of a Dirac measure, but uh, quantum mechanically. Right. So here it's going to be a wave function parameterized by Q and P. Q is going to be a position, P is going to be a momentum. And the formula is here. And if you look at the formula, yes, what do you what do you see? Well, you don't see very much because this thing is dying. Well, here you have a plane wave at the frequency uh, P over H bar, right? So the wave vector is P over H bar. And this plane wave is modulated by some envelope, which is a Gaussian envelope centered at Q of width of order square root of h bar, right? So you have inside the, uh, inside the blob corresponding to this Gaussian here, you have many oscillations. So the blob, the center of the blob gives you a position. And if you look at the orientation of the hash that you see inside the blob, the oscillations, it gives you uh, the uh, momentum, okay? So with one function, you encode a position and a momentum, right? Now you look at the projection, the orthogonal projection on the linear, uh, on the line, the complex line, which is spanned by this QP. So here, this is the Dirac bracket notation for this uh, rank one projection. And you take a superposition of these rank one projections with your favorite uh, probability measure, mu. Okay? So that's, uh, that's, that's going to be a density operator. And uh, then it's been known that for, for, density, for density operators of this form, then... Um, <clears throat> You can control the distance between your initial probability density f in to r in, and you have this inequality here. But in particular, if uh, you are wise enough to take mu initial to be equal to f initial, then this disappears, and you have the fact that this is exactly equal to lambda dh bar. Right? So you have an exact computation in that case. And uh, therefore, uh, well, I mean, the, if you take the, if you just assume that the support of mu is included in k, then the infimum, which is here, is nothing but the square root of lambda dh bar. And in that case, uh, this turns out, uh, so you replace this by square root of lambda dh bar, and this is really high school mathematics, maybe at the time where you and I were in high school. Well, you were, I was in high school 10 years before you, but... Yeah, but maybe probably when you were in high school, you would know, I mean, not you, but your classmates would know how to do this. Yes, of course, you, of course. I mean, but even the classmates would know how to do this, or would be in trouble, right? Um, okay, so another, another example is the case of a pure state. So, yeah, I mean, so here, um, well, people usually prefer pure states because Schrodinger equation is something equations operators and all that. Some people have to... So it's a genuine dislike for operators. I don't know why. I mean, there's a beautiful operators. I mean, there's, there's the things that resemble the most uh, classical mechanics, whereas, you know, uh, there's no such thing as a wave function in classical mechanics. In a way. So anyway, so, but that's a prejudice. At least it's a function. Okay, so here, so, uh, all right, so RT is going to be a pure state, right? So it's the image of, of psi initial by the quantum dynamics. And so uh, I'm going to choose uh, f initial of QP uh, to be uh, the mod of uh, the inner product of uh, my coherent state with psi initial squared divided by 2 pi h bar to the d. So this thing goes by the name of the Husimi transform of psi initial. And in that case, you have an observation constant, which is given by this, again, explicit formula. Again, high school mathematics to some extent. I mean, maybe uh, one year after high school, right? Okay, and here you have, uh, yeah, I mean, here you have explicit constants, right? 
voilà, first explicit constant, which comes here. And the sigma is, uh, yeah, it's also explicit. Okay? So, explicit constants everywhere. Um, okay, so where are we uh, saying here? So, in that case, ah, yes, how, how the, so, okay, so now, um, I showed you the. Um, I showed you that the right hand side. I hope to have convinced you that for some uh, reasonable class of initial data, this thing could be uh, really controlled and bounded below. Okay. Now, how do you how do you prove this? Well, uh, so uh, very simple. So you take f of t to be the the um, propagated the classical density, r of t to be the propagated quantum density. And then you look at the difference between uh, the trace of chi times R of t, where chi is going to be a localization, which is going to be a modification, really, of the indicator that you fall in omega delta, right? So it's a localization. Uh, it's a, yeah, it's a truncation function. So it's a function chi of x, right? And so you look at the, the trace of, so you can think of this as a multiplication operator, chi rt minus the integral of chi of x, f of t, x and psi. Well, if you look at this difference here, um, you don't know what to do, except that uh, if you think in terms of uh, optimal transports and couplings, then immediately you can see, you can, you, you can put this under the same integral, and that involves chi of x minus chi of y. Aha, but chi being a smooth function, uh, you can apply mean value theorem. So this is bounded by the Lipschitz constant of chi over lambda times x minus y to the squared, right? And so it doesn't hurt adding the difference in momentum. A, B, I mean, the thing is, that if you just put the, the position, it doesn't propagate well. But if you add the momentum, this propagates very well. Now, then here you use the propagation inequality. So you know that this difference here is going to be bounded by the Lipschitz constant of chi over lambda times the distance uh, at time t. And you know that uh, this distance uh, is propagated with some, um, some exponential amplification, which is uh, controlled by the Lipschitz constant of the force. Very good. So once you have this, then um, you, express, uh, yeah, you express this quantity here uh, by the method of characteristics. The method of characteristics tells you that this quantity is expressed in terms of the initial data. And since I control really the difference of the absolute value between this term and that term, I can say that, for instance, this is bounded below by this minus that. Okay? So uh, at the end of the day, I get that the integral of the trace of chi times r t dt is bounded below by this quantity. Uh, minus this uh, semi-classical correction, and you choose uh, chi of x to be, uh, uh, now you choose chi of x, now it's no longer a synfinity function, it's going to be a Lipschitz continuous function, so it's 1 minus the distance from x to omega over delta, positive part, and you have the Lipschitz constant, which is equal to 1 over delta, and this gives you exactly the inequality which I showed you, okay? Good, so then we have this uh, observation inequality, so I think it's about time for me to conclude. Yes. So here, uh, yeah, a few words about this. Okay, so this observation inequality for quantum dynamics, it uses only the assumption that v, v is regular enough for uh, having the existence and uniqueness of the classical dynamics by Lipschitz, uh, by the Cauchy Lipschitz theorem. Right? <laughs> I mean, Cauchy Lipschitz theorem, if you want to define the classical dynamics, uh, you want V to be uh, C2 or at least C11, right? To, so that the gradient of V should be Lipschitz continuous. Now here, the observation constant is explicit in terms of the geometric data entering the bardos lubov controllability condition. Uh, I mean, the difference with classical, uh, I mean, with classical approaches uh, to this problem is that here, you use optimal transport and this quantum analog of the Wasserstein distance, which uh, allows for uh, having less demands on, on the regularity of the, of the operator, right? So the V doesn't need to be more regular than necessary to define the classical trajectories, right? Which is already something. And also the um, uh, constant, uh, you don't need H bar to go to zero. You need H bar to be small enough so that the constant to the right hand side is 
um, positive, right? So that could work with finite H bar, right? So that's uh, that's um, yeah. I mean, that's something already. Okay, um, uh, yeah. I mean, possible extensions. I mean, there's one that's been done by Emmanuel, uh, which is uh, here in his PhD thesis, which which is to include a magnetic field, right? So. Um, um, yeah, I mean, if I return to the, uh, where is it? So, yeah, I mean, you could uh, really uh, look at uh, Schrodinger equation with a magnetic field, uh, replacing the Laplacian here by the square, I mean, replacing uh, minus h bar Laplacian by uh, minus i h bar gradient minus a, where a will be a vector potential to the square, and that would I mean, then you have to be a little careful about the propagation. Uh, you would get a result like that, similar result at the same time. You have, to, you have to be very careful with the propagation because, you know, then uh, including a magnetic field is the lower order perturbation of, uh, this is a sub-principle per, per, uh, um, um, perturbation of the Laplacian. Okay, it's not leaning order uh, perturbation of Laplacian. Nevertheless, you have to, there's a nice little trick to control that. Uh, yeah, I mean, you could also think of uh, using uh, using uh, Laplace Beltrami operator on manifold, but that's uh, that's going to be the propagation thing. It's going to be uh, less uh, nice. It's not for a birthday conference. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe not that of a friend, actually. <laughs> okay. All right, what was I to say? Um, yes, let me. Yeah, I mean, we can look at all the dispersive dynamics like Klein Gordon and whatnot. We can think of obtaining a controllability statement also. But here, duality is not going to work that nicely because I have to restrict the class of. Uh, the class of initial data uh, to obtain a nice um, explicit constant. So I'm not very optimistic about uh, this extension here, but who knows? Who knows? Yeah. Okay. So most important message, happy 50th birthday. Okay. This is uh, the beginning of a wonderful story, but let me return to where we first met. Yeah. I mean, so we, we met, uh, yeah, yeah. We, so we met when you were, when you were a PhD student with Jan, I was, uh, I, uh, yeah, well, I had a very big responsibility. I was appointed to be your tutor, whatever that means. It meant something like uh, just uh, checking that everything was all right with Jan, <laughs> which I did my best, but uh, there wasn't very much to do. And uh, yeah, so I was your tutor, but however, I didn't, I didn't meet you. Uh, so at some point, uh, Jan told me, oh, I have a new student, a very uh, interesting and original uh, person. Uh, I'm sure you will be interested to meet him. I said, okay, fine. And uh, let me show you the place where we met for the first time. Maybe, I don't know if you remember. So the place where we met doesn't look very nice. It looks like, uh, it looks like a prisoner of war camp of uh, World War I. It's not like that. It's, not, it's in front, as a matter of fact. And the picture is from quite some time before we actually met, because we met in 1996. <laughs> so it, it's, it's, it has, you, you see that it has bars on the windows, you know, bad sign. So it looks, uh, we've not been in jail. Yeah, but we've not been in jail, right? We, 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 we have very high moral standards. We've not been in jail. I mean, not yet, right? <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> so that's 1920. So if you look at the same place, uh, so it's not such a bad place as it, as it would seem at first sight, because if you look at the place uh, 46 years after that, then you see important people uh, visiting that place. And actually, the place where we met is uh, next to the building, which is right behind the goal, right? So uh, do you know where that is? Yeah, it's in Lima. Yes, exactly. So it's near Paris, right? It's not as bad as it seems, right? It's near Paris. Uh, yeah. But I don't have a picture from uh, when we were, yeah, so when we met. Well, I mean, yes. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. But there was a very pleasant place to do military service, right? I mean, it's, I mean uh, yeah. I mean, you cannot complain, right? Okay, very good. So happy birthday again. And thank you. Uh, thank you for everything, right? For, I mean, for all the things that we've done uh, together in those years. Thank you very much.